Hello and welcome to Church Connect. It's really good to see you. And uh, I'm Beverly Bedford. And I'm Martin Irwin. And it's really lovely that you could join us today. And our theme um, this week is what does a church look like now? And uh, during Life Connect throughout the week, we've been looking at that theme. Have you enjoyed it, Martin? Yeah, it's been it's been good, Beverly. I, uh, you know, as I was preparing the theme uh, for this week, I, I was really struck by the simplicity of what Jesus has called us to. Um, so I think just as each person has been unpacking it through the week, uh, God's not complicated the message. It's us who complicate it. And that's what struck me. Yes, and, and those themes of um, the great commandment and the great commission uh, to love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our strength and with all our mind and to love our neighbour as ourself, how uh, important that is just now, um, our communities and to be loving our neighbours and to be that visible presence in our communities is so important. And I, I think as well, Beverly, you know, as... Um, uh, you and Phil and uh, Darren have unpacked the Great Commission. The Great Commission is the outworking of the second part of the Great Commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. I, I had um, a church leader say to me some time ago that, you know, we ought not to mix up showing kindness to people with telling them the gospel as though the two were in conflict. Um, you know, I think we should love people irrespective of whether they ever respond to the gospel loving people is loving people but you know i'm not loving them if i'm not telling them that god loves them that he sent christ to die for them and that they can know god in a personal way through jesus christ so for me those two things are completely integral no that's that's been brilliant thanks beverly well we've got some great interviews coming up uh today so we've uh, we've got uh, a long-standing counties evangelist mike strange so uh, you know mike I do, yes. He's a little bit close to me. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's been really good. Uh, when I so, first became uh, an evangelist, uh, he was so welcoming and kind. No, that, that's brilliant. And his ministry has changed quite considerably uh, recently. Um, just before lockdown, uh, Mike began a new work um, with a, a re replanting project of a, a little church. And uh, he's going to tell us um, something about that. Very different from the school's work that he's probably best known for. And then uh, our second interview is going to be Martin Kurczynski. Am I right in thinking you trained with Martin when you were training as a county's evangelist? That's right, we did. We trained together. We did indeed. You can't tell me any stories about Martin, no off air. No, nobody's listening. Afraid not. I'm paid too much money for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who by? <laughs> by Martin. <sighs> okay, well, that's, that's great. And then um, also 360, I know that's your favorite part of uh, Church It community. really is. It really is. I love it. Yes. So we've got a good program. Thank you. So we're very excited to have uh, Mike Strange, our evangelist, uh, who has um, planted a church in Mir, and he's going to share with us now. Okay. Hi, Mike. Welcome to Church Connect. It's great to have you with us. Hi. Hi good yeah. to see you, Helen. Hi. So you've been a, a county's evangelist for over 30 years now. Yeah, long time. Long time. And I know you're involved in, in lots of other things. Mere Community Church is a county's church plant, been doing it for about a year. The church was going to close. The membership was down to about, well, I don't know, four proper membership, very small. Um, but the members didn't want it to close. Um, and so I stepped in with others um, and it was a complete new beginning. Mere is not the Wiltshire Mere. It's near to Glastonbury in Somerset. Um, all kinds of stuff attached to Glastonbury, you know, different kind of place, man. <laughs> <laughs> so small beginnings, complete fresh start, um, but got some great people around with us. We now have a leadership team of five and attendance at the church, something like 16 on a Sunday would be about normal. OK, so after um, the lockdown began and church moved online, can you tell us a bit more about how that changed for your church? Well, happily, we've got a good website to begin with. My younger son does that. Um, and having an online presence was important to us as part of the church plan. So it was relatively easy to start doing video services um, and putting those on the website. So the service is virtual 
And interestingly, although people watch it at all times of the day and night, um, most of our congregation literally sit down at 11 o'clock on a Sunday and kind of watch it together, you know, or they're apart. Isn't that sweet? We get roughly twice the number of watching than used to come, which, though it's not massive numbers, is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. We know who some of them are, some of people in the village that were kind of on the fringes, um, but we don't know who they all are. Are there any other unexpected outcomes from, from the way that you do in church at the moment? Yeah, lots of good stuff, actually. WhatsApp, we have a couple of WhatsApp groups. So we are now, there's more prayer and there's more fellowship because we're talking to each other all the time, right through the day and into the evening. Um, any prayer, stuff like that, we're praying for each other, just chatting, sending videos, sending words of encouragement, um, all sorts of stuff. That wasn't happening before. So that's better. More prayer, more fellowship. The leaders' meetings are brilliant. We just, you know, about an hour. There's no driving. Um, you know, we just we just sit down and, and have a, um, a, you know, meeting online. Perfect. What's not to like? Can't see us going back to um, what we was before, can you? No. So lots of benefits, actually. Lots of pluses. So how do you see um, the church moving forward now in terms of the general church you know can we reshape it now for a greater harvest do you think yes we've had some unexpected outcomes greater harvest i think we'll need to rethink our virtual presence we're not going to want to stop that are we after mm. so what will that look like the virtual service is half the length of a normal service so it's just half an hour i've got a thing less is more can't stand long services. No one wants long services. After an hour, I've had enough. Don't know about you. Want to go home? Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I've never liked long services. And a virtual service is half an hour. And you don't want it more than half an hour, do you? So yeah. what does that look like? And then I had an email this week. The last three, four Sundays, the Lord's led me to preach about some stuff I've never preached about before, um, about the role of the holy spirit in our church life mm. i discovered all our new leadership team we're all on one page with this um and so i've been able to say some quite hard-hitting stuff which we will want to put into practice when we meet back together again so church isn't gonna look like it looked before if we are gonna do what the lord's been saying to us so that's all looking interesting I had an email this week. Somebody watched the last Sunday service, liked it so much, they watched it twice. Now, that doesn't normally happen, does it? No. So, yeah, church is not going to be the same, the other side of all this. And I think there are going to be lots of benefits, lots of good stuff come out of this. The Holy Spirit is working and he works online just as he works face to face. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Well, that was really good interview, and I found it quite interesting, um, the statistics of um, how that, when we look at Google, how that people have been uh, going online, um, looking at prayer, and how the online services, uh, our church services, have just rocketed it, and people uh, from the comfort of their own homes are watching services. How, how have you found that, Martin, with statistics I think it's, it's remarkable. Uh, um, Tear Fund asked uh, Comres, one of the polling organisations, to do a poll for them on uh, the UK attendance at an online service, an online Christian or religious service, in the first month of lockdown. And the statistic that they came up with was absolutely amazing, Beverly, that uh, just under 25% of people in the United Kingdom attended an online service of some sort for at least some time in the first month of lockdown. Now, that says that there is a, a spiritual hunger and thirst there in, in people's lives. And we can see it in online connection and attendance. The, the other thing I'll mention um, there is an online interview that Nicky Gumbel has just produced last week, and uh, he is blown away. It's quite moving, really, uh, the number of people who are attending online alpha courses. Um, you know, I think people are interested in exploring faith, and they don't like having too big a barrier to 
a threshold to get across in order to be able to explore it. And we think something like the Alpha course is a low threshold. It's food. It's, you know, it's quite low key. Uh, it's discussional and so on. But people still have to turn up and meet in person, physically, those they don't know, uh, people they've never met, eat with people that they would not necessarily choose to eat with. Um, but Zoom Alpha courses have completely changed the game. And Nikki Gumbel is very clear about that. We, we began, uh, uh, it'd be interesting to get your own reflection on this, Beverly, but we began an Alpha course last week with Queensway Chapel, the church where I'm one of the leaders. We had eight uh, people signed up to it, along with Rachel, my wife and myself. And um, three didn't turn up. One sent us a message to give a reason, a childcare issue, and hopefully they'll join us in week two. But five people attended, including a guy who, um, you know, lives not very far away from us. And he wanted to attend a Zoom Alpha course in case it became physical so he could turn up. But we had no idea. We'd never met him before. We would never have connected with him through the church. He just was not on our radar. And, uh, you know, a mum from the family centre that the church runs just says, I believe somebody's there, but, you know, this is a good way to explore it. She, she probably, because of childcare challenges, may never have been able to turn up physically. So that's remarkable change in the landscape. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, it's, it's that old um, chestnut of people are restless, aren't they? And uh, yeah. until they find their rest in God, and there's something yeah. within the human soul that searches. And when we're not so distracted in life, and when the scaffolding comes down, and when we're really up against the wall, that actually... Um, within our hearts is, is that desire after God and to see it uh, in the UK is just um, really um, awesome isn't it I think there was a map that showed all the red lights flashing where um, the zoom right. calls were being um, uh, put out, uh, out and you know to think that people are listening to the word of God and, and listening to testimonies and uh, hearing and because faith comes by hearing doesn't it and hearing by it the does. word of God so it does, and the Holy Spirit, you know, I think Nikki Gumbel says that uh, in that interview, the Holy Spirit is not bound. You know, Zoom is not an obstacle to the Holy Spirit convicting someone in their living room or at their kitchen table or in their study. I mean, that's just what an encouragement to us that God is not in lockdown. And I think for the church in this moment, in this season, we need to not just grasp that, but to allow that truth to grasp us. And interesting, the data you're talking about there, yeah, Zoom produced a heat map. They, they had a worldwide crash uh, on the 17th of May, and it was caused on Sunday morning, the 17th of May, by the church in the United Kingdom accessing Zoom. I, just... You know, we could never have imagined that kind of thing happening, but God is on the move. Amen. That's right. He really is. Amen. So this is my favorite part, the 360. One evangelist, three questions, 60 seconds. Good morning. I'm Janet from West Wales. I am an early bird after having a dairy farm for years. So I've already had my time with the Lord, and now I'm ready to help with um, chatnow.org UK. Speaking to people right across the world, praying with them, pointing them to Jesus. So that's my morning schedule. And this afternoon, if it's dry, I will probably go on my bike and ride up some really steep hills. Or other times I like to walk up my hill where I can see for miles right across West Wales and Snowdon and pray for Wales. So I don't have an office. My sunroom here is lovely in the summer. Um, I spend a lot of time in my garage labelling Bibles or in my car, usually travelling to schools. But with lockdown, all that's finished. But I thank God he's not locked down and his word is not fettered. So God bless you. Bye bye. I uh, have loved going up uh, not so long ago to Stockport to meet Martin Korczynski. He is planting a church, has been leading a church plant on Brinnington, which is... Uh, uh, a large estate uh, on the edge of Manchester. And uh, Helen caught up with Martin just to see how things are going for him in this season of lockdown and as we move beyond into further freedom and to listen to Martin's reflections. Uh, so let's hear what uh, Martin had to say. 
So hi Martin, welcome to Church Connect. So you're the pastor at Brinnington Community Church in Stockport and you're also an evangelist at Counties. But could you tell us a little bit more about your church and, and its setting? Hi Helen, yeah I'd be happy to tell you. Um, at the church where, where I, I am is called Brinnington Community Church and we're in a, a neighbourhood of high social deprivation and we've been here about eight years now um, and we've always sought to alleviate as much as we can some of the, the needs in the community to serve the community in those ways and to in, in way, any way we can and also to, to meet some of those needs or go towards meeting those needs in a, in, as an expression of Christ's love. Um, so we've been busy, we, there's, there's lots to do here and we get, we're as busy as we can, we've got a, big, a good network of volunteers working together and serving in the community every week, week in, week out, most days. Okay. So since the lockdown began and the coronavirus came about, how things changed for you as a church? Uh, so normally, as part of um, serving in the community, as a church, we, we run a lot of uh, things in the building, a youth project. We have, we run a rock stars youth club. We do some youth outreach work. Um, we have an after hours uh, late night youth thing for older kids. Um, we also have a food bank, toddlers group, we've, all that kind of thing. We've run Esau classes, English classes for refugees. So we're quite busy that way, but a lot, it's all group activities. So that all, obviously any group activities been impossible to do since the lockdown. So we had to curtail all of that at a drop of a hat, really. Um, and so initially during lockdown, it was about trying to keep in touch with people because everyone felt the uncertainty and everyone felt, I, if you can remember back to the beginning, there was so much uncertainty and fear. It was kind of fear driven all the, uh, the, the, the uh, meth, uh, methods that the government took to, to control the virus. It was kind of fear driven, which you can understand. So it was a, a lot of it at the beginning was just about keeping in touch with people and trying to give them some sense of normality that we were still here, the people that we were in touch with regularly. And then we, I, I felt right at the beginning, I felt that the church should take a lead in this. Uh, we didn't have much resources to do some of the things that I felt like needed doing, but I thought, I prayed and I felt that like God said, you know, the church needs to take a lead in this. If everyone else is hiding and running scared, the church needs to show courage and the church needs to uh, make themselves available. So the first thing we did was on our Facebook page and all the other um, media that we uh, link with, we put out that we would provide emergency food packages for people who were stuck, who couldn't get to the shop and were isolating, etc. At the time we had about, um, I don't know, I think we had a couple of ladies gave about 20 quid each. So we had about 40 quid in the pot. Really, really shopping. But um, one way or another, um, everyone else started to follow suit. The, the local charity, a local charity here called um, The Hub started to provide food parcels and they were doing quite a good job of it. I thought, well, maybe, maybe we're not needed. But then within a week, they were shut down because their organisation said, no, it's um, lockdown now. You can't have direct contact with the public. And guess what they did with all their donations they had? Their hundreds and thousands of pounds worth of stuff, they gave it to us. <laughs> so uh, we were the last man standing, basically. And uh, we, so we just took it and we made it onto food parcels. We've been giving them out ever since. We kind of took over. It, we, you know, we had a small part really at the beginning, but we ended up being the only people doing it. So it's been, you know, the community is very grateful that we, we continue to do that. And how are you building on those relationships then with these, these some of the maybe new people to you as a church? Yeah, well, most of it's um, just introducing ourselves as neighbourhood chaplains also created some cards which um, gave information about um, helplines and you know th places that people could contact if they needed help during the, the crisis, which was not only ourselves. Obviously, there's other organisations involved and the food bank numbers and things like that. Um, but I also introduced them to the idea of the neighbourhood chaplains and told them that we were here for them and gave my number out. So it's just basically spreading the word that the name neighborhood chaplains is in the area and that uh, it's connected to the Lighthouse Centre, Brennington Community Church and that we're here for them and just want people to know that we're here for them and sometimes you don't see that as being an immediate benefit but it does people remember if you're there for them I think. Have you had any response from, from people who you've given out the food parcels to? 
Yeah, lots of gratitude, definitely. Lots of gratitude. And we've also and we've also sent cards, follow up cards to some of those people who were who were struggling. With a lot of gratitude, but also I had a lady who's asked me for a Bible. She's messaged me and said, oh, I think I'd like to have a Bible. Um, so I'm sorting her out with the Bible. And other people who've brought donations in said, oh, I want to give something back. You know, can we bring donations to the church, which they have done. And so it's just about relationships that are developed. It's, I mean, it seems like a long time, doesn't it? But really, it's only about 10 weeks since lockdown started, 12 weeks since it really, 10 or 12 weeks since it really bit. So... Uh, we've been quite busy with things, but we have, I think we've just, it's just starting relationships with people is the important part that we've done, which we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do to know with those people without the lockdown, without the, the crisis. So Martin, this is an opportunity for us to have a little chat. <laughs> and um, My, fa my favourite part. <laughs> I'm really interested in um, an article that you've um, produced and uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I've, um, I've been asked for some time by Echoes International, who are a sister organisation, good friends of ours, um, supporting the work of missionary, God's missionary work worldwide. They asked me if I'd write uh, just a blog that goes on their, on their web page. It, it got me reflecting on what is God saying to the nations uh, but primarily for us here in the UK, and that's where our, our primary focus and perhaps our primary audience is, um, what's God saying to us right now? And here, here's the first for starters. Let me throw this back to you. I really believe that we shouldn't, let's not fool ourselves. People have genuinely had a fear of death. They've had a realization of their own mortality, the fragility of life in this season. I, is that something you've noticed as well? I'm not just imagining that, am I? No. Um, you know, going from door to door uh, previously before lockdown, you meet some interesting characters who have great opinions and, um, you know, getting to know people uh, and their stories, it always comes down to the fact that um, there is that fear of God and fear of death within every human being. Um, it's the unknown, it's the uncertainty, what lies beyond the grave. Um, and definitely I've encountered that a lot, Martin. Uh, pe people are, you know, even, even fear of leaving their homes. You know, even those who in this season are being encouraged to move out and meet in family groups or meet in the garden, uh, you know, there are people who are not leaving their homes who are, you know, legally now allowed to, being encouraged Um you know, to, to just start to move, but they're, they're just terrified. They're terrified. And I think it's the fear of death. I, I think as the church, we need to recognize that. I, I mean, I grew up, I, I don't know how much um, hellfire type preaching you heard in Northern Ireland. You and I uh, grew up in Northern Ireland where there was a particular style of preaching called hellfire preaching. And whilst, you know, I think some of that was scare tactics and, um, a little bit shameless, if I'm, if I'm honest. I, I think, nevertheless, the reality of eternity, you know, um, the, the scriptures say in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11, that God has set eternity in the human heart. He's put eternity in the hearts of men. And I, I think that this season is a great reminder to the church not to let that go. You know, he, heaven is a real hope for the believer. Um, being with Christ, which is far better, is why Christians, when they mourn the loss of a Christian loved one, don't grieve the way the world grieves. And I think we need to present that hope with a greater clarity in this season. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, as, as a nurse, um, I faced people dying so much and uh, they do want prayer and they do call out to God. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God without a knowledge of Jesus, without... Um, knowing where eternity lies for you and I think that's being manifested now as people know that they can get ill they can get a disease um, and they can die because we've had those statistics um, and there is a hunger to know about God and to know about his truth. Thanks Beverly I think the second thing that I, uh, you know, reflecting on Psalm 9, uh, the nations have dug a pit and fallen into their own pit. Uh, I'm reminded, and it's not, it's not there precisely in Psalm 9, but I don't think it's stretching it in the context of Scripture to say the, the gods of this age have been proven by 
God to be fragile, but they are stubborn. You know, when when Elijah pulled the um, uh, when Baal was shown, the prophets of Baal were shown to be false, you know, that their, their God or their gods were useless, you know, and Elijah mocked them when he called down fire and they were dancing and cutting themselves and dancing naked and making fools of themselves. Elijah says, you know, maybe he's on a break. Maybe he's gone to the toilet. You know, maybe he can't hear you. You need to shout louder. Look, the gods of entertainment and sport and shopping and commercialism and consumerism and financial markets, those gods are fragile. Every single one of them had a collapse in this season, not just in the United Kingdom, but globally. I mean, that's remarkable globally, but it only takes Nike, the shop to sneeze. And there's a queue outside of elbow prodders because the gods of this age are not only fragile and they're proven to be worthless in terms of giving hope, but they're stubborn. So they will be back. And I think the church need to recognize that our culture hasn't changed. It will revert to type before long. And we're in a moment of opportunity. That's right. It is really a moment of opportunity. And, you know, when I think about the gods and and, uh, I think about uh, when you see how God um, dealt with Pharaoh and all the gods of Egypt and he brought his people out and he gave them freedom and they still hankered after Egypt, even though it was such a hard place to be and they had freedom and they wanted to go back to what they had. And, you know, it's it's extraordinary, isn't it, Martin, that that there is a hankering after materialism and uh, all the gods that that we see in the world, uh, because it means that they have to bow to the God, the amazing almighty God, which our stubborn hearts won't want to do. Yeah, and I think when people talk about freedom, I think you just choose your master. That, that's the reality of the human heart. Mm-hmm. And um, I think the gospel message is an encouragement to people to choose a master who says, I, don't, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Um, well, I mean, what a message we have, you know, that there, there is a master worth serving who laid down his life for us. So uh, th- th- there is real hope. It takes me to the third point. And we touched on it earlier as we reflect it on online access, that there is a new thirst for the gospel. So people's recognition of their own mortality. I think many have recognized that the style, the lifestyle that they were pursuing is fragile. And there are people who are not believers who are questioning that. And I think the church in the UK need to recognize and grasp that moment. But therefore, there is this in interest and increased interest in the gospel. We talked a little bit about Alpha. And yeah, you've had... Um, uh, nurses contacting you and uh, people, medical staff who who probably have not been religious and they're thinking, asking you to pray for them and sharing stuff with you that you would never have experienced before. That's right. Um, I mean, you know, it's a real privilege to pray for someone and to when you when you hear someone ask for prayer, it makes you realize that they believe there is a God and that they believe that our God has the answer and um, you know really all you're doing is connecting them to the Prince of Peace and that's what the UK needs it needs the Prince of Peace it needs to know that uh, things are going to be okay you know and when we pray uh, God changes things I had one nurse in the hospice who was terrified to go into work there was no PPE for her and uh, she wasn't sleeping so I prayed for her that God would give her sleep and that he would deal with the uh, fears that she had. And when she went back to work, she had slept. And uh, the, the lorry just drove up with the new box of PPE. That's how good our God is. Uh, he great. answers prayer. That's great. And he answers prayer. You know, that's the other thing. Um, he answers prayer uh, for unbelievers and, and when believers intercede to point people to the reality of his son. You know, I'm still a believer in signs and wonders. You know, we might get in trouble for saying that. I've said it, not you, so you won't get in trouble. I'm a believer in signs and wonders. And and with this regard, that God wants people to to honor his son. And so he will intervene in the most miraculous and wonderful ways, whether it be dreams or, you know, let tell you, Jonathan Brain, a county's evangelist, had a bizarre dream. We put it on our Facebook page last week. He had a bizarre dream about a gazebo. He had no context for the dream. But the next day, someone said to him, would you like a gazebo? 
And he said, yeah, sure. And I think there was another conversation that took place as well. So um, on that Sunday, just a couple of Sundays ago, he set up gazebo church on his front lawn and people socially distancing and all meeting the regulations. But they gathered, and I think 15 people gathered outside his garden. And um, they were all from his little close. And, uh, and two asked for Bibles afterwards. You know, th- th- there are amazing things happening. I think you were reflecting on something happening at New Quay as well, a kind of open air church in New Quay, yeah. a car park church. They did because people are just desperate to be together, you know, to see each other. And uh, uh, Matt Thames uh, there uh, had a car park church and everyone gathered. And it was just wonderful to hear worship. We miss it so much to be able to yeah. sing together. And they were in their cars from safe distances and the children were having a really good time. They were eating, fellowshipping. And it's just that hunger and thirst for God, isn't it? Uh, and yeah. for fellowship and uh, for family because that's what the church is it's a community that uh, loves each other and uh, you know this hunger and thirst you know i'm excited by it martin because when i read my bible when the people hunger and thirst for god he comes uh, in revival and in, in mighty power and you know i'm really looking forward to the days ahead and all that he's got planned Beverly, it's been brilliant to be with you today um, to unpack some of these things. We've only scratched the surface and we've barely touched on it. But um, thank you to uh, you for watching and for tuning in. I really want to encourage you, if you find some encouragement from this, please share it. Please repost it. Post the YouTube link. It's on our YouTube page, Counties Connect. And it's also on our Facebook page, Counties Evangelism Network. Reshare it repost it and encourage your friends particularly church leaders to access this material and um beverly it's been a pleasure it's lovely to be with you martin thank you yep god bless goodbye and goodbye from me and it's goodbye from him <laughs>